Welcome to worship on this fifth Sunday of Easter. This morning, we will be worshiping through our prayers and songs in the Liturgy for Christian Unity. And during our prayers of the people, we will share in a Mother's Day litany from the Sing to the Lord, a new song, a new Moravian songbook that came out a number of years ago and uh, has a wonderful resource for this day. You can still follow along with it if you'd like in that hymnal on page 122 for the Liturgy for Christian Unity or through the PDF that was included in your congregational email on Friday. And it can also be found in the From the Pastor blog on the church website and via our Facebook post of today's service. If you haven't yet received our slightly delayed May newsletter in the mail quite yet, you will be receiving it very soon. We also included a digital copy of it in our congregational email on Friday with a quick link there at the very top of that email. There is a lot of information contained and included in that document, that newsletter, about what opportunities we can engage in right now and stay connected together as a church. We know there are still needs for connection and we will continue to seek creative solutions to meet those. There is not a clear date for us to regather in person for many good reasons. There are many things that we must consider and have plans in place before we can go forward, whether inside or outside of our buildings. We are exploring some alternative options to be able to at least see one another in some limited ways, and we hope that you will give one of them a try. The first two of those that we're making available to you are today, May the 10th at 12 noon, you are invited to join us on a Zoom for our very first Congregational Zoom Fellowship. For every Sunday throughout the rest of the month of May, you can call in at 12 noon from your regular home telephone number using the number that's provided for phone use or from your computer to connect and to hear each other's voices. And if you're on a computer or a tablet, you might even get to see faces too. We hope that this will be a good way to let us see the faces and the voices that we are missing by not gathering together at church in person. All of the connection details have been shared in our May newsletter and in that Friday update email. And I hope to talk with you, many of you, soon. Now yesterday, we had a soft launch of our weekly drive through canned food collection that will continue indefinitely during this time. Each Saturday, you are invited to swing through our parking lot via the Cherry Street entrance between 9 and 11 a.m. and drop off canned food items to be shared with Crisis Control of Kernersville. To help meet the food needs that we know are here in our community, we ask that you stay in your vehicles and have your items to be donated ready in the back seat or the rear hatch of your vehicle for volunteers to simply reach in and collect. We are shifting to this model for helping to meet a critical need for many during this time. And in doing it in a way that allows us to connect with each other. Remember that Lois Merck we celebrate her birthday with her tomorrow. I hope many of you have taken the opportunity to send her cards and notes, but she celebrates that 92nd birthday on Monday, May the 11th. We are also invited by Lisa Turner to remember her parents, George and Lois Newenhouse, as they celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary this coming Saturday, May the 16th. We especially lift up the family of Elizabeth Mitchell as her grandmother, Elizabeth Conrad, is nearing death as I record this today and may enter the more immediate presence of our Lord and Savior very soon. We especially also remember this day all of the women in our lives, those who have filled nurturing roles for us, those who have taught us and led us, 
those who have enriched us on this Mother's Day. I also invite you to remember that even while we are unable to gather in person, many aspects of our congregational life do continue on and they do need your support during this time. We give thanks for all who have continued to contribute regularly during this time and we remind you that your offerings can be mailed into the church office or dropped off in the gold painted wooden collection box that has been placed in the church street entry. We check both the post box and this collection box daily and secure those contributions. Remember, we will be counting next tomorrow and then in two weeks from now. I invite you to take a deep breath and enter into your holy and sacred space wherever you find yourselves this morning. For God makes all of life and all that is around us holy and precious. So let us enter into this time and begin the worship with the music of our prelude.
We join our voices now as we pray together our Liturgy for Christian Unity, found on page 122 in our hymnal, or via those PDF copies provided by email or on our website. Let us pray together. Almighty God, you are the one who called this universe into being out of nothing. You created everything that is. By, By your power, power you hold together, together all space and time and, time and substance. substance. By your hand alone, creator God, the inanimate elements became alive so that we could live and move and have our being. We, we celebrate, celebrate life, the, the precious life you have, have given us, and we celebrate that, that unity of mind and emotions, of body, body and soul, that you want us to enjoy and share with, with each other. We rejoice in the centrality of Jesus Christ in all your works, for he was with you from the very beginning and is supreme over all creation. We, we praise, praise you that, that Christ, Christ is before all things and that in him all things hold together, especially our very fragile, vulnerable, and often broken lives.
gracious God, for establishing the church as a single body of interdependent members, each having a place and a purpose. We know, we know that we need each other and are called to appreciate the great variety of gifts you have given us to use. Help us to rejoice with those who are feeling joy and delight. Help us to sing with those who are singing your love and praise. Help us to taste the agony of those who are hurting. Help us to share the burden of those who are in distress. Take away jealousy and resentment from our hearts when we see others achieving success. Fill us with that spirit of unity in Christ that lets us see and feel and know that we all belong to you through the grace we have received. Teach us to know and love the worldwide church called out of all peoples and nations. Make visible the unity that you desire as we express a spirit of reconciliation in all our relationships. Show us that we are part of the one and only body of Jesus Christ, unified by faith, scattered for witness and service. Lead us to appreciate the richness of our diversity and your creative power at work in our various traditions and customs. Make us all one with you by the inspiration and the guidance of your spirit. Lead us into lives worthy of our calling in Christ with all lowliness, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another in love and, and eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We, we pray, pray for this, this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together for the grace that we need, saying, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Dear God, as we, your people, gather in every time and place around this wondrous earth, may we be strengthened by our awareness of one another and united by our mutual prayers. Hear us and help us all, we pray. May the variety of traditions and customs of your whole church become a multitude of lights to reveal the good news needed by people everywhere. May the variety of our ministries and service convey your redemptive love and bind us ever closer to one another. Grant, Grant us grace to unite in essentials, to accept diversity in non-essentials, and to love one another in all things.
our scripture. We are invited to hear one of the songs of refuge from the Psalms this morning. It lifts up the chesed, the steadfast love of our Lord, which is with us and abides for us in all things. Psalm 31, verses 1 through 5, then 15 and 16. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me. For you are my refuge. Into your hand I commend my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. this morning we find ourselves in this strange Mother's Day moment. Hopefully most of the women of the congregation received some form of a greeting card from the Women's Fellowship honoring all the variety of ways that we contribute to the nurture and work of this congregational family. Maybe some of us have some physically distant celebrations planned where we might bring together the different generations and households of our families today. Maybe others face this day with a seat at the celebration that is newly empty. Maybe others are not able to gather with mothers and important women in their lives because they are in nursing homes or elder care facilities. 
that are taking serious precautions for the health and well-being of their residents in this town. However, that you enter and move through this day, you are invited to think on the voices of the women who have shaped your life. So I invite you on this day to consider what are those words or regular phrases you always heard on the lips of the women who raised you and still stick right there close to you. We are born through relationship. We come into this world through the lives of those who birthed us, carried in their bodies, surrounded by the rhythm of those women's heartbeats. And throughout this life, we are called over and over again into relationship. Let us remember and uphold the sacredness of all those relationships that we are woven into and upheld by in our lives this Mother's Day and in every day. Let us remember that it is to relationship with God, with Christ and with the Spirit and with one another that we are called. And now as we pause in some musical reflection, I invite you to remember the depths of relationship that we are called to live out. As we share in this time of thinking of the ways that we can respond, let us consider and make those choices to respond to the ways that we are able to offer of our God-given talents and treasures to do the work of Christ, the work of relationship in this world. In our John text this morning, we drop into the passage known as Jesus's farewell discourse, part of the five chapters that describe the evening when Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Throughout this section of the text, 
and the ones that accompany it. Jesus tries his best to prepare the disciples for becoming the church, the hands and feet of Christ to heal the brokenness of the world and to model the relationship that Jesus has been trying to show them the way of throughout his time with them. Let's read John chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going, Thomas said to him. Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and my Father is in me, but if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let your hearts be troubled. That probably seems like a tall order these days. And we really need to remember 
that the disciples are hearing Jesus say that their hearts should not be troubled moments after they have watched Judas walk out into the night, which in John symbolizes his betrayal, and they have heard Jesus predict Peter will deny him three times. Do not let your hearts be troubled is not a simplistic, don't worry about a thing, God's got it. It's God knows how hard it is and how many times our hearts are deeply troubled. The disciples, when Jesus says this, are no doubt deeply troubled. They are confused and reeling because they sense that everything is about to change and they aren't sure what is coming around the next bend. They feel they don't have a roadmap to follow, but even if they did, I'm not sure they could have made any sense out of it while in that state of anxiety and grief that they are feeling. We are struggling with much that is troubling our hearts in these days. We are longing for the familiar and we want to return to it. Sometimes so much so that we'll listen to only those things that give us the imagined way that things were going to be just like they were before. We hear the siren song of reopening, but are so eager to go and do without adjusting to the precautions that we know are good for us, the precautions we know we should be taking. We are longing for companionship and the familiar faces of community gathering around us. If you've been able to step back from some of this with your own personal responses and see the bigger picture, it has been interesting to watch the waves of emotional response and the stages of grief that have been on display during this time. There's the denial. It's all going to be okay. We'll just slow down for a little bit. It'd be nice to have a slower pace for a few weeks to enjoy the spring as it comes. There was the anger. Wait, what do you mean that's closing? Or why can't I have that just the way that I want it? How I feel most comfortable experiencing life? Or hold on, I'm working harder than I ever have but you are complaining of being bored? Or the rage that can rise up in us when we are feeling lonely or find ourselves feeling isolated and cut off from the world. Then comes the bargaining. It will all be okay if I can trade what I was used to for this new way of doing it. That'll fix it. Or if I can just fill in the blank, then it will all be wonderful and okay again. Throughout the denial and the anger and the bargaining, the rushing to try new things, attempting to embrace the novelty of the moment, filling our time with the projects we've always been able to push off to the side, We've expended a lot of energy. Maybe just in trying to make sense of the news that's coming at you and not knowing which news to listen to and which news to tune out. Picking and choosing in the midst of it. Feeling confused, maybe. But all of it takes so much of our energy. And then the depression sets in the malaise of being overwhelmed as we struggle to integrate all that has changed around us into our understanding. Every new piece of ongoing limitation, every extra step or new routine that we're being asked to consider and weave into our living feels like one more fresh blow big enough to take us down with it. And we try so hard not 
to hear, not to take in, not to have to adjust. Isn't at least one of those stages where you're finding yourself right now? We don't generally stick to just one stage in the process when we are grieving. We transition in and out of these stages, moving among them forward and back as we each individually make our way through them, following our own unique pathways toward acceptance. And I've been thinking that as a whole, maybe we clergy and others have done you a disservice. Many of us transitioned quickly. We created alternatives and we offered a plethora of different responses in this time, each of us experimenting in ways that were comfortably in our different wheelhouses of gifts. And it led to a great deal of variety in alternative and creative expressions and experiences of church. We offered different expressions and possibilities that were grounded out of what we had available with us to work with. Sometimes with lots of hands and hearts and minds involved and sometimes with just one or two. But maybe some of it made it look too easy for you. And then again, maybe not. Some of you have been willing to admit that you noticed how tired I seemed in some of the videos during this time. I was tired, probably a lot more tired than I let you see. All of this is hard for all of us because so much of what we expect church to be is grounded in both a place and a gathered group of people. Is it hard for you to just join in worship through a screen? I know it is because it is incredibly difficult to prepare for and preach to a camera. If you listened closely to my sermon last Sunday, you probably heard my dog get up and you could hear her nails as they clicked across the hardwood floor as she trotted across the room. I had to cut out the section when she started shaking her collar and jingling her tags. Step back, restart, pick up right where I left off and keep going. And some of you might never have noticed that there's a place where there's a quick little transition, that's when it shifted. That's when I had to cut out the video and change it. At another point, you might have heard David's footsteps in the background, followed by the refrigerator door shutting. Yep, that was another splice, where I pointed out how well all that sound was carrying to him. Why didn't I chase everyone out or go to the church? It was too late on a Saturday night to do so. Trying to pull my thoughts together and face another week without the human interactions that help a pastor to deliver a sermon was hard to do, hard to face. But we do, not through our own strength or our own solutions. And in the midst of all this, we are asked by Jesus to not let our hearts be troubled. He knows that our hearts are going to be troubled. That's why he says it. He knows that the ones he is with when he says this had hearts that were full of trouble. And that's why in the Gospel of John, we spend the first 12 chapters of the book covering the events of three years. And then we spend chapters 13 through 17 on the events of one night. And it takes five chapters to express because it is such a hard concept to wrap our minds and our lives around. It is an important night. The night when Jesus washes feet and shares in a simple meal. Because in John, this isn't the Passover meal. Jesus' death happens on the day of preparation, the day leading up to the Passover. 
He has a different timeline than the other Gospels. And he doesn't offer the words of institution over this meal as the other gospel accounts do. Instead of the words of institution, he offers a different set of incredibly important words. Jesus is teaching the disciples how to get ready for what their next, their what next is going to look like. Not for Jesus' death, but for what comes after that. He is trying to prepare them to become what they are meant to become together, the church, as he ascends and returns to the fullness of God. Jesus tells them and us that they and we are already knowledgeable of the way. We already know how to go. Bless Thomas. Always with the practical questions. We don't know where you're going, Jesus. How can we know the way? Thomas wants a roadmap, a set of directions, some coordinates to plot. Give them to us and we will follow them to the destination you hand to us. We'll have a nice adventure getting to the place where you send us. And Jesus adds another one of those I am statements to the list seeking to help them understand. I am the light, I am the living water, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am the way. But you all do know the way, Jesus says, I am the way. The way doesn't lead us to a place, the way leads us into relationship. Every one of the I am statements that take this form point toward relationship, not a destination or an object or a way of being. Jesus isn't telling us that he's a path to follow. He isn't sending us on a grand treasure hunt. Jesus is simply telling us that the way is through relationship. The relationship between he and God. The relationship between us and God. The relationship between us in community together and our God that wants us to be in relationship with each other. We are looking for a way, a set of steps tasks, actions that allow us to return to what feels like normal, familiar, patterns that we know because all of those tangible things and rituals offers us a connection to our faith. But Jesus offers us a different answer, just like he offered it to those disciples who were grasping for the roadmap. I am the way. Relationship is the way. What if reclaiming the focus on relationship is our way forward? What might that look like? As Moravians, we have a story about an experience of exile far harsher than anything we now know. In 1621, the churches of the Unitas Fratrum were confiscated in Prague and the surrounding regions. By 1624, all 200 or so priests of the Unitas Fratrum were banished from Moravia and Bohemia. By 1625, safe refuge in other neighboring lands had been secured for those religious refugees of the Unity of the Brethren. Those who had the means or the status to journey into exile left behind everything that they knew. Others had to stay in the places where they already were, gathering in secret house churches, singing, praying, reading scripture together that they might still be in relationship. Because for our faith as Moravians, we have always known that our faith and relationship with God comes most alive in our relationships with one another. 
Jan Amos Comenius is writing throughout this time of exile, this hidden seed period that was so formative in our faith tradition is filled with a deep sense of hope in the power and the strength of living in relationship with God and one another for him and our ancestors in this faith this hope had to become untethered from a particular way or a place of gathering and find new life in the deep and expansive creativity of our God. And where did it lead? To other bands of refugees who found an estate in Saxony. They gathered there throughout the 1720s, seeking a way to practice their faith that was deeply relational once again. And then once they all got there, they couldn't agree on what those ways to be in community might be. So they met and they talked and they built and rebuilt relationships in ways that led to the renewal of that ancient Unisistratrum. In today's renewed Moravian church, in our newer hymnal, Hymn 398 is one that is suggested for our use when we think of and celebrate the renewal of the Unitas Fratrum. It seems especially appropriate in this time when we are having to figure out new ways for our relationships to hold us. When we are grieving the usual places and patterns that have held our relationships and have been the place that we came to know God for so long. I invite you to hear these words that speak not just to when our human bonds are broken by disagreements, but also simply by separation and distance. While we find new ways to adapt to masks and sanitizing surfaces and being mindful of viruses, in ways that almost none of us can remember ever having to do before. God, when human bonds are broken and we lack the love or skill to restore the hope of healing, give us grace and make us still. Through that stillness with your spirit, come into our world of stress for the sake of Christ forgiving all the failures we confess. You in us are bruised and broken. Hear us as we seek release from the pain of earlier living. Set us free and grant us peace. Send us God of new beginnings, humbly hopeful into life. Use us as a means of blessing. Make us stronger, give us faith. Give us faith to be more faithful. Give us hope to be more true. Give us love to go on learning. God, encourage and renew. As you move through the week that lies before you, I invite you to find hope and allow your hearts to feel just a little less troubled as you remember that we already know the place we are called to go. That place we are called to go isn't really a place it is a relationship with God. And in everything Jesus does, he constantly points us toward abiding in this relationship with God that we are meant to share in together. Resting in it, gathering strength from it, and creating the opportunities to be in it. We deeply feel the sense of disconnection from the patterns and the place where we usually find this. And in this changing time, just returning to the place won't automatically offer relationship in the ways that we are accustomed. So let us, individually and together, begin the work of finding creative ways to be in relationship with God and with one another. Just as our ancestors in this tradition did in ways far more challenging 
and radical before us. It is our calling. This morning, as we enter into this time of prayers for the church and the world, it seemed like the right time for us to pray together as we remember all those who have mothered us, all of those who have experienced the varying roles of caregiving that we usually assign to motherhood. And so we invite you to share it this morning in a special liturgical piece from the new Sing Unto the Lord, a new song worship book for the Moravian Church for Mother's Day. The piece is available for you by PDF, and it will also be on some of the slides that follow. So I invite you to share with us as we pray this together. Lord, on this day, set aside to honor and remember mothers. We give you thanks for our mothers. We are grateful that you chose to give us life through them and they received the gift of life from your hands and gave it on to us. Thank you for the sacrifices they made in carrying us and in giving us birth. We thank you for the women who raised us, who were our mothers in childhood, whether birth mom or adopted mom, older sister, aunt, grandmother, stepmother, or someone else entirely. We thank you for those women who held us and fed us, who cared for us and kissed away our pain. We pray that our lives may reflect the love that they showed us and that they would be pleased to be called our moms. We pray for older moms whose children are grown Grant them joy and satisfaction for a job well done. We pray for new moms experiencing changes that they could not predict. Grant them rest and peace as they trust you for the future. We pray for pregnant women who soon will be moms. Grant them patience and good counsel in the coming months. We pray for moms who face the demands of single parenthood. Grant them strength and wisdom. We pray for moms who enjoy financial abundance. Grant them time to share with their families. We pray for moms who are raising their children in poverty. Grant them relief and justice. We pray for moms who try to balance vocation and family. Grant them courage for the living of each day. We pray for stepmoms. Grant them patience and understanding and love. We pray for moms who are separated from their children. Grant them faith and hope. We pray for moms in marriages that are in crisis. Grant them support and insight. We pray for moms who have lost children. Grant them comfort in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We pray for mothers who aborted their children. Grant them healing and peace. We pray for moms who gave up their children for adoption. Grant them peace and confidence as they trust in your providence. We pray for adoptive mothers. Grant them joy and gratitude for the gift you have provided. We pray for girls and women who think about being moms. Grant them wisdom and discernment. We pray for women who desperately want or wanted to be moms. Grant them grace to accept your timing and will. We pray for all women who have assumed the mother's role in a child's life. Grant them joy and the appreciation of others. We pray for moms who show us the way of faith. Grant them the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We pray for those people who present 
who are grieving the loss of their mother in the past year. Grant, Grant them comfort and hope in Christ's resurrection. Lord, we thank you for the gift of motherhood. We thank you for the many examples of faithful mothers in scripture, like Sarah, Hannah, Elizabeth, and Lois. Now hear the names of other women who have inspired us by their motherly examples. We pause in silence as you lift up those names for your own lives. We are mindful this day of all these women, and especially Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had the courage and faith to say yes to your calling. May these women throughout our congregation and throughout our lives continue to be examples of such faith, and may they model for all the rest of us what it means to be your disciple. Bless them on this special day in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face be lifted upon you, filled with graciousness unto you. May the Lord's countenance rise and shine upon you and give you the deepest of peace. In the name of Jesus, we come. Amen.